Okay, thank you for joining us today. Just a few very quick reminders before we get started. All attendees are muted. If you are using the event app, we encourage you to check into the session, update your activities, and be sure to complete the session survey at the end. This session is TLP White and is being recorded. Recordings will be available within 24 hours via the app. And with that, I would like to introduce you to your session moderator, Sean Richardson. Thank you and take it away, Sean. Awesome. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, no matter where you are. I am, have the pleasure to introduce uh, Mark Stanislav. This is the Know Your Audience Using Personas for Better Peace or Outcomes. And with that, Mark, we'll take it away. I will say if you have questions, do please put them in the Q&A box. I will be uh, queuing those up for Mark towards the end of the talk. Okay, great. Let me just check this box. And... Do you see my screen? We can, we, there you go, perfect. Perfect, okay, great. All right, thanks so much, Sean. Um, so, hey everyone, uh, so nice to finally get to chat with you. I know we've all been waiting for this event and uh, huge, huge appreciations to the first team for making this work uh, despite all odds. So I really appreciate being able to do this virtually. Um, hope to see you all next year though, for sure. Uh, so as Sean mentioned, uh, we're gonna be talking about personas and how it relates to PSER. And if you don't know what personas are yet, you're in the right right talk for sure, and uh, I'll definitely sh shine a light on what that is and how we use them in my uh, my previous role running a PSER. So uh, contextually, and this will make more sense beyond the uh, kind of the, the obvious. Um, so currently, I'm an uh, information security architect at Cisco. I'm also a PhD student at Dakota State University in cybersecurity, and I've had all these other roles in my career. So previously, and a lot of what this this talk is predicated on is running product security and response and AppSec over at Duo Security, which is a part of Cisco. Um, but I've also done managed service provide, uh, provider consulting, security research, Unix admin stuff. So in, in each of those roles, the needs of my kind of professional career, the needs of my teams are very different, right? And when we think about how we interact with people, just kind of generally, we really should contextualize what their needs are, what their wants are, uh, what their problems are and how we can maybe lessen those problems. And so in this kind of framing, if we look at the idea of personas, and you'll hear this as personas or user personas, uh, very often regarding, you know, product research, design research kind of uh, fields. Uh, and this, this idea, which I won't read the whole blurb for you, but basically the idea of there are, there are facets of uh, kind of this broader archetyped view of people that we can create this human representation of part of our audience. And we'll talk about a lot of those different, what, what those parts might be coming up, um, but basically trying to boil this very broad ocean where you don't wanna overgeneralize people, you don't wanna you know, treat them stereotypically, but at the same time, if you're trying to address major audiences, you can't cherry pick one by one every time. So contextually for what I just introduced, Mark the college student, as you might imagine, uh, is not, really the same person practically when we're talking about interaction or needs or wants or desires as Mark the security researcher. So as a human, I've done both of those and, and many more things. But if I were to reach out to your organization and talk, you know, talk to your PCERT as a security researcher and or I'm reaching out as a college student who maybe is an end user of one of your products, the college end user is a very different type of persona than the security researcher reaching out. And certainly when I say security researcher and PCER, uh, you know, I, I know there's a lot of uh, maybe, maybe concerns there, but we're going to talk about how personas can help uh, in addressing these different audiences and really making for better outcomes uh, as kind of promised by the, the title of the talk, hopefully. So a few things to think about as it relates to personas. I called it out once, I'll call it out again because it's very important. Personas are not stereotypes. We are not taking these very ticky-tacky representations of demographics and, and you know, very often hurtful things that we generalize people into groups. What we do want to do, however, is a really a research-based approach to there's an audience type. How do we qualify that audience type with certain um, edges? And it's not perfect. It's not meant to be perfect. But uh, there are many ways to do this. And if, and if you're going to attempt to build personas or work with a team that's going to build personas with you. Uh, on, the, on the left side here, I'd highly recommend many of these sources and many of these approaches are used 
in building that representation of this archetype of a uh, really a persona. A couple of the easiest ones, direct interviews. So uh, design research teams that I've worked with before, and if they want to talk to someone who's an IT admin or a security person or you know what have you, they'll just grab someone from part of the team they work with and start asking questions. And they'll have a very you know specific list, but they'll just get your honest feedback. And then they'll try to take you know the edges of that feedback and actually come up with like what is the representation that we can use here for a, a persona. Certainly, academic publications or uh, broader surveys and questionnaires. You know, if, as long as it's a representative sample and well done. Um, watching people work, as creepy as that sounds, certainly uh, versus the direct interviews. Perhaps if you are trying to build personas of a certain uh, uh, form or, or function, really, if you just see how people interact in their job, see the kinds of questions they're asking, see the kinds of concerns they have to get their job done. These are the things where, uh, as kind of the, the pull quote in here calls out, it really is about getting away from you. You know, you have biases, you have preconceptions, you have maybe um, past history that's shaping or warping your view on certain audiences. And this is how you bring kind of the empirical as reasonable as possible back into this persona creation process so that it's honest, representative and uh, you know thoughtful. So here's an example persona. This comes from a, a design blog that I found an example of, and we have some more to look at. Um, but just as like one quick introduction, right? Amy doesn't exist. This is not a real person. Um, that photo is probably a stock photo. Her being 16 years old from Phoenix and single, these are all things that were uh, maybe influenced by someone real possibly but they should not be a one-to-one -one mapping to a real person, for instance, right? So this is more of a uh, awareness for this blog post in, and you can kind of see a little um, sample a couple paragraphs down there. There's like actually a narrative about this person. Like they don't exist, but you're treating them as if they do exist. And you're treating them that they exist that way based on all that research, based on all the uh, analysis you've done of that audience type. And calling out you know, goals and motivations, just being aware of who they are, what they need, what they want, is a really strong way to start working towards addressing your audience versus just projecting against your audience. And if you're starting to think, and we'll certainly get a lot more into this, um, you know, PCER, well, I, don't, I still don't understand how this is related to a PCER mark. Uh, so the great part is if you, like I, consider that product security instant response is a customer service function, which I, I really deeply do, then you're on the right path already, right? Because if you're in customer service, what you're really looking for is not closing bugs as quick as possible and patching things as quick as possible, because those are very transactional things. What you're really doing is building relationships. And when you build relationships, you focus on customer experience. So when you reach out and communicate to this persona type, to an actual person on the other side of an email, let's say, you're tailoring that response for that audience type. You're thinking about their needs and wants and concerns and fears, and you're trying to come up with the most uh, approachable way to handle that engagement and create a dialogue that builds that relationship based on customer experience focus. We also, as I can say personally myself, and I'm sure other people that have run a P-cert or, or, or even a C-cert before, you don't want conflict whenever possible because people shut down, they stop responding, they stop engaging, they stop helping. And often when that happens, it's really kind of just an accident. It's not something that someone's trying to do. It's not um, trying to drive them away. It's these accidental things that we're not thinking about personas, for instance, as how we're engaging, focusing on what they need and what they want, which helps the former. Uh, and then the other part of this is it's for your team as well. And this is something I did with my team to help them. The people on the front line, they've got all the pressure, they've got all the stress, they've got all the frustration, whether good experience, bad experience with a certain reporter. These are things that we have to be really considerate of to help prevent our people to burn uh, from burning out. And if we help them from, uh, if we want to help them prevent burning out, giving them the tools like personas to use will actually smooth their uh, smooth the conversations, hopefully avoid those missteps and actually create better outcomes. And it really is not that complex to start. And this is kind of the, the seeding of the data that we'll walk into a bit more. But you have, in, in my case, I've broken these out two ways, non-customer types and customer types. So your bounty hunters, uh, your security researchers, they could be customers, but often not. Often they aren't. They're just you know people looking for vulnerabilities, doing security research, 
uh, for, for fun or for, for work or otherwise. And then you have a bunch of customer types. So that could be the engineer who's going to decide if your product's secure enough to deploy. It could be your end user types or uh, an IT admin that has to actually deploy it. That could be a CISO. I mean, it really is no limit to which ones you want to create personas from. It just should be kind of an important group or audience to your business or your business type. On the right side, we see kind of just the same words from the left with a name added to the right. And you're like, wow, that's not, it's not very exciting, Mark. Like, why is that how you create a persona? Um, but this is an example where if you look at actually the, the right side, um, Lee, the end user, Andy, the end user, Gary, the IT admin, those are actually real personas that do a security had created with the design and research team. Now, the ones above and below uh, that you don't, uh, that I didn't mention, those are ones I just kind of created offhand. And the one we're really going to talk about today, because we only have 30 minutes and I want to make some question time available, uh, is going to be Bin the Bounty Hunter. So we're going to talk about Bin and how I created a persona for this bounty hunter. Um, and so just one more thing to look at real quick. These are just, again, these are real uh, personas that were created by Duo of fake people. Um, so Lee, the end user, and, and Max, the vendor manager, there's a bunch of them at Duo. But I just want to show you another set of examples of uh, kind of concerns and pay points, subjectives, uh, the characteristics of these people, their backgrounds, and also kind of these quotes as if there's real people speaking. Again, you're, you're really trying to normalize this in the culture of the business and the organization. And I can attest to directly um, when Duo uses these, the entire company uses them. The security team, the design research team, the product team, the sales team, every single person at Duo uses personas. And when everyone does it, it works out really well. So this may be one of those things that as you're looking to bring on personas, perhaps you can go talk if you have, you know, obviously product security, uh, if you have a product security team, perhaps have a product. So if you have a product, uh, go talk to your design team, go talk to your user experience team, your customer experience team. They might already be using personas and perhaps you can just piggyback on that effort, expand the use case and really drive that further within the organization. When we're thinking about how to build BIN, one of the things I just brought up was, hey, data, data first, right? Well, if you need to have data, Mark, where do you get data from? So here's a great example, and this is from uh, HackerOne, the, the kind of bug bounty company. They have an annual report, and there's going to be many pieces from this, uh, which I'll call out. But here's one really interesting example talking about when you have security researchers, where Where's the money coming from? Where is it going? How much of their livelihood is predicated on this? And a couple of quick call outs. Number one, 100% of income comes from basically hacking, security research, whatever you want to call it, but bug bounty finding. 22% uh, of the entire sample size audience, 100% of their income comes from this. So the next time you talk to a bug bounty hunter and you're you know, thinking, hey, they just want you know, 50 bucks for this cross-site scripting or 35 bucks for this C-surf, um, it could be because in their entire income is based on this. And so uh, just, again, it's a, it doesn't change your, maybe your response, but it might change the way you engage them. You might consider this as their livelihood instead of just like a fun thing they do on the weekends. And that's a very important kind of conceptual and um, empathetic shift when you have an audience like that. And we can also see that a lot of money starts in the United States, uh, $30 million of it but only $6 million comes back to the United States, which tells us there's a wild disproportionate change between who funds bug bounty programs and where bug bounty programs money goes. So you also should be cognizant that, hey, a lot of these countries represented, their cost of living might be dramatically lower than the United States. And there's, in my experience, there's not really a cost of living modifier for bug bounties. So we'll talk about this more for BIN, but these are really important things to be cognizant of. And you know, one report, a couple of screenshots, and some of you on this call might be going, "Wow, I just, you know, I just thought it was, hey, I want a free T-shirt, hey, I want fifty dollars." Um, a lot of this might just come down to like socioeconomic status and livelihoods. It's a really basic concept that you find when you look for the data to find. So here's BIN, and so BIN, um, he's early twenties, uh, living in China. Finishing up a computer science degree, not shocking for a bounty hunter necessarily, has a part-time job as an InfoSec analyst. Nights and weekends is really the time that he's spending mostly on bug bounties. Um, and so in his case, really motivation-wise, extra income to travel. You know, he's been in university. He wants to take some time off, enjoy the world a little bit more post-pandemic, clearly. 
uh, building a reputation, right? A lot of bug bounty hunters build reputations with the bounties they find, the companies they find issues with, uh, which is good for career trajectory and resume building. And then also just impressing his friends. A lot of people in computer science program look at his skills, are really impressed. They talk him up. They introduce him to people. He builds his network. Bin doesn't exist. This photo is a stock photo. All, these inform all this information I made up, but I didn't totally make it up. Um, and so where did I get some of this bounty hunter? Again, the Hacker One report is just an invaluable source of, uh, of data. So we see that you know 41% of people are uh, half studied or are studying as an under, undergraduate of this sample size. That's a very pretty representative amount, certainly the largest percentage of the entire uh, group. Um, what describes you best? And this 59% uh, hack as a hobby or my free time just the same as Ben. Ben does this on nights and weekends when he has extra time. The age ranges, we see that 42% is between 18 and 24. Again, the largest percentage of bug bounty hunters are in this college age range. And then also keep in mind, going back to the socioeconomic part, in China, a entry-level InfoSec analyst full-time, and remember, Ben's only a part-time worker, earns about $20,000 in China, so probably about $10,000 uh, for BIN, but it's $60,000 in the US. So that's a 3x multiplier. So if you're thinking about a bug bounty that's, let's say, a $10,000 bounty, I mean, that's a, that's a good bounty, but they certainly happen quite often now. That could be an entire part-time InfoSec analyst salary in China. And again, when you think of it that way, you're like, wow, that's, I mean, that's a game changer. And in India, um, if you, you have, or you are in India, you know, proportionately, I mean, a 20,000, 12,000, $20,000 job in India for security engineering, you know, uh, kind of senior intro, senior pen tester, depending, that could be a good job. And in the US, I mean, $120,000 would be very obvious, you know, for a lot of people in a lot of markets. That's maybe five or six X. So we really have to be thoughtful to where people are, what their lives look like, um, education, income disparities, uh, cost of living, uh, opportunity. These are all really important things. And those are things I thought of when I created BIN. I wanna really understand that persona. I'm not gonna read through the side chart. You'll, you'll have the slides after this talk, of course. Um, but this is important context to do when you're doing this process. So when the PCERT engages a persona, what we, what we wanna start doing is leveraging the persona. And we do this by saying things like, um, how likely is it that this person might speak at an industry event? Because if we wanna obviously be represented well at DEF CON next year or Black Hat next year, and this is a person or a persona type that often speaks at those conferences, there might be a little bit of extra I dotting and T crossing you want in your communications back and forth, right? Um, the same thing for, uh, media and, and press outlets. Again, this isn't about restricting a security researcher as, as a security researcher, please don't restrict us. But um, it's more about remembering different personas will have different levels of um, potential impact on your business revenue. They'll have more opportunity, more likelihood to post to blog post and Twitter and make maybe a bigger splash. So again, it's not about looking at these as negatives or positives, it's about likelihoods. Just like you do a, th a threat matrix and it's an impact and a likelihood, we're kind of doing a threat matrix relative to a persona type. And then we're contextualizing why it's high, why it's low. And this is the kind of crib sheet that you can give your PCERT frontline people so that they have a little bit more understanding that, you know, yeah, it's not great if the bug bounty hunter, um, you know, it walks away and they're not quite happy in the general sense. As long as you did a good job, you, you treated them well, you were thoughtful and, and, and took them seriously, they're probably not going to damage your business revenue because the bounty hunter wasn't happy with not getting a bounty. Um, but if you treated them unfairly, if you uh, ignored their, their vulnerability, you didn't triage appropriately, there's a high potential they're going to go to Twitter and tell the entire information security community that. So you really have to trade these things off and be aware of these at all times. Like, where are you investing? Where are the potential downfalls? Where's your return? And if you normalize this process with personas, you can create one of these for every single persona. And I'll kind of show you a, a quicker splash screen view of this in a second. Uh, so in these, in these kinds of contexts with a bounty hunter, like with Bin, for instance, we just want to say, hey, you know, read our security response page, um, figure out if they do go on Twitter or do post on blogs, uh, 
make sure that they know or don't, or, or make sure they know whether or not we have a bounty program up front if they are a bounty hunter, because we don't want any confusion. We don't want any miss, you know, again, avoid those missteps. Just make sure that everyone's on the same page. Um, we can also see if they've submitted a lot of things to us in the past and are those things accurate? Are they representative? But try not to, with your piece or team, tell them that you're going to fix an issue if it's not going to get fixed because they'll follow up and follow up and follow up. And if you don't fix it and you never intended to fix it, that's a misstep that you could have avoided. We should also not overstate the value because remember, a bounty hunter is looking at things in value lens generally. And if you say, hey, this is a great bug, like really, really important, but it's not. And you're just trying to be polite. You're trying to just close the loop and get done with the conversation. You've done the opposite with your persona for a bounty hunter. Ben wants to hear that it's valuable and they want to hear that it's important. You saying that to be polite is actually creating a new problem for your PCR, not removing a problem. So one thing I always told my team is frame this in consequences. So again, just an overview, what would happen, like a worst case scenario, what would happen if a bounty hunter found it? a high security def uh, severity defect, you've got to kind of go through this process individually, but, and you can read the slide later, but basically just saying, we want to represent our company well, we want our PCR to be representative of the security program we run, we want people to trust our security program, and if you ignore a bounty hunter and you're rude to them and you ignore their bugs, that could turn around to hurt you in the community of security professionals and that could turn around and have number, uh, a number of CISOs that are involved in the security community look at your brand differently, look at your security program differently. So it's not always just, hey, it's a bug bounty hunter, they just want you know, a, a bounty. There are consequences and you really need to be thoughtful about what those might be. Uh, so just quickly comparing two personas. So Ben on the left, uh, Gary, our IT admin on the right. They're very different people. They have different lives, different stories, different needs. Um, you know, Ben in this case wants a little bit of extra money for travel and he's in his college years. Gary has kids and he's married in his forties. He wants to keep his job. That's Gary's motivation most days of the week, right? And these are things that, you know, being remembering that like Gary's accidentally finding security bugs usually. Ben is looking for security bugs. Gary can go like, hey, step one, step two, Ben can provide you maybe an exploit, right? Very different personas, different capabilities, needs, wants, desires. Um, and if Gary's upset, you might not get that contract next year. If Ben's upset, maybe a blog post gets written. Um, another eye chart, again, great thing to look at after the presentation. Um, your company, your, your PCERT may have a different perspective than this and certainly how you qualify low, medium, high. But what I'd like to have you do if you build personas, build a chart like this and then add context to it for your PCERT team. So when you're looking at what are the risks if you don't treat Lee well, the, the corporate end user or uh, the college student, or these are all variable. And a lot of this is predicated on businesses I've worked for. So take it, you know, take it your own way for sure, but build one of these and you can start heat mapping out how personas relate to the risks that your business can avoid if you avoid those missteps. Um, quick anecdote, we're going to be running into uh, a Q&A here in just about a minute or two, um, but calling out, hey, it's security engineer at this company, that design uh, that they saw, they're not happy with, PCERT kind of gives them a generic response. The issue reporter goes back to the PCERT and says, hey, I'm going to publish these details in my corporate blog. It's a big blog. People are going to see it. And the solution, this is a real life anecdote that I worked my team through. We had to go and use a third party, friend of a friend, reset the whole conversation, start over. Um, and as soon as we did all of that, we, they didn't publish a scathing blog post about us, which is great. We, more importantly, we found out what they were actually trying to communicate to us. We were just on two different wavelengths and just not talking it, it kind of the right framing. They helped us get a POC done of the actual code fix. I mean, this is above and beyond what most PCERTs can deal with. And if we had used the personas and my team had used the personas, which we didn't have yet, they would have known, hey, high engagement, risk to the business, risk to um, revenue, risk to public blog posts, because they had a blog, they had you know, Twitter uh, with a lot of followers. These are things that the persona kind of cheat sheets that I just showed you, that would have helped my team out immensely. And this is one of the stories why I actually created the personas that we, we do had, uh, we, they do have today at Do Security. Um, it's not about tricking anyone. It's not about fooling anyone. It's about empathizing and be, being relatable. Hey, Sean. 
Oh, can't hear you. There we go. Hey, so uh, we're, we're getting down to the last couple of minutes. Uh, we, we do have a question or two queued up. Are you ready to answer a few questions? And for anyone who's got a question, please be sure to add it to the Q&A box at the bottom. Yep, uh, uh, give me one more minute, I'll wrap up these and we'll be on our way. Um, and so just when you look at those areas, like those dimensions of risk, in this case, almost all of them were true with this person and we completely, you know, Kevin McAllister did, it was a bad situation, right? Um, and so this is another kind of longer form slide I want you to like read through top to bottom. We're not gonna go over it here, um, but really think about every reporter that comes in the door to PCERT, really do this kind of who, what, where, when, really evaluate them, look them up and analyze the situation, build, you know, map the persona that's relevant to that person. Um, and this ties directly into your piece of workflow. If you use the ISO 27,000 workflow, um, there's a lot of things that can simplify those conversations. When you have a response page, when you have security at TXT, when you have a good front door, when you have an SLA published, people know what to expect, what not to expect. Um, and thinking about assume positive intent, always, always, always assume people are doing their best, are trying to treat you with respect and you should reciprocate. Don't be complacent, no matter who you think it is, treat them as if they're going to impact your revenue, as if they're going to hurt your brand. Um, and manage implicit bias. This goes back to avoid stereotypes, build personas, do data-driven analysis for those. And lastly, but not leastly at all, empathy. 100% of everything that goes into customer experience, customer service, and just being a good human comes back to empathy. We build personas to exercise empathy. And if we do that, we're going to have a better time, your frontline people, your business, uh, and most importantly, your reporters that are reaching out to your PCER. So um, that's it from me. Again, I hope you get a chance to look at the slides uh, a little bit more in depth and uh, please reach out. And Sean, yeah, I'd love to hear that question. If I can go, go ahead. Absolutely. So someone wrote in and said, my responsibility is one sub device of a, a product which consists of hundreds of devices. Would your idea work out for such a non end user product too? So it sounds like maybe doing internal. Yeah, great, great question. So there's really no um, constraint to what a persona can represent. So you can have an end user persona. Uh, you can also have, as I kind of showed, like an internal IT admin persona. You could have a help desk persona. Um, really, the personas not, are not limited by a, a technical domain um, because design research is everything from cars to security gadgets, right? It, uh, design research is, is more of a domain and personas are a facet of design research. So in my case, I'm using it for PCERT, but really it's a very open-ended kind of vehicle that as long as you can do your research on your audience and create that persona, there's really no limit to what you can make a persona for. That actually leads to our next question from Peter, who said, who within a piece would actually do all this stuff? Whose role would it be to map all the possible personas and answer all the questions? Um, in, in my case, the person that runs piece uh, I was I was the head of our piece uh, for the company, and I took it upon myself because, again, I, I had my AppSec team, which owned our piece function. They were my front line. Um, and so I built the personas, I, all the kind of eye, eye charts and a lot of other things that are internal, of course, that I can't show. Um, that was 100% that was me because, again, I want to reduce my team's burnout. I want to make sure we have good interactions because who, who gets the escalation if it doesn't go well at the front line? Mark, Mark does, right? So everyone's incentivized to have this go well. And for me, it's just like a, a top-down leadership thing. But this could be a really fun thing, especially in a virtual kind of pandemic world. Do this as a team build, you know, kind of team building exercise. Have people break up in small groups, build a persona, do the research together, present it to the team and then aggregate them. So you can actually divide and conquer this quite well, just kind of set the guardrails down so everyone kind of comes back with a consistent um, persona type. And out of curiosity, Mark, how long did it take you to put this together? Um, so I, the, the larger cheat sheet I have, so kind of that uh, the heat mapping and some of the contextual stuff for all those different roles, uh, it was a couple of days of work and it, it really is less work than it seems like because if you know your audience, if you've dealt with bounty hunters, you've dealt with IT admins, you've dealt with security engineers and researchers, you're more playing back a lot of the, hey, this went poorly, why, why was that? And then you go do an interview of that kind of person and say, hey, when you reach out to a PCERT, what do you expect from us, right? So you kind of look at your historical, like where did things go wrong? Because often that will teach you the lessons you need to be learning, but you know that they went wrong. 
The question is, why did they go wrong? And that's where your research comes in. That's where you reach out to people. And in my case, I have a you know big network of lots and lots of different persona types, researchers and bounty hunters and IT admins. And so I just ask my community, the Hacker One report was another great source again to really contextualize um, that that specific part of the you know the field. But it's uh, you know it's a labor of love for sure, and uh, it's one of those things if you kind of just sit down, create your personas first, uh, or define your persona types first, and then say where could I get useful information about this type, this type, this type. Get your data sources, look at the data, and then aggregate. So it's just kind of a workflow, and if you do it once, you could do it five more times just as easily. Awesome. Excellent. Mark, thank you so much for your time today. This has been an excellent talk and I certainly see a little homework for myself over the next week or so, but uh, thank you all very much. Thank you so much, everyone. Thanks, Sean. Appreciate it.